And today's New Testament reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 29 through 12, chapter 2. So bear with me. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as if on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For, uh, for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Zephthah, of David and Samuel and prophets, who, who thought faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, received promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched ranging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, one, str one strength out of weakness, become mighty in war, put foreign armies to fight. Women, uh, women received their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to um, accept release that they might raise again to, be a, to, a, to a better life. Others suffered mocking and uh, scourging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sworn uh, in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in, sky, uh, in, in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, affected, affected ill-treated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering over the deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all, the, all these, though, were, though well uh, um, attested by their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had pers uh, foreseen something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by, surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings to so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfect, perfecter of our faith, who for, the, who, for, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, desp uh, despising the shame, and the seated at the right hand on the throne of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. So we have had tremendous worship already and sharing um, from this week, and I want to adapt my sermon accordingly. Um, there's been a lot going on for all of us, and some of it has been spoken, um, and some of it lay silent on our hearts. Suffering <laughs> is hard, um, and life is messy. And there are times when um, we, like the Israelites, um, have been damaged and are stuck in suffering as um, they were as slaves in Egypt. And there are other times that the suffering comes that we helped create, um, like the Israelites um, and the practices that the prophets spoke out against um, that then culminated in the Babylonian exile. We come to this space to bring all of that suffering here and to have honest and deep relationships with God and with one another that can both heal us and hold us accountable. This isn't easy. Um, I'm thinking about a time when a parishioner at my last appointment was going through one of those periods where everything was falling apart and looked at me and saying, if I can just figure out a way to get through this, and then you know how it goes, then everything will be okay. And I, as a pastor, had to say, actually, no, it's not going to all be okay, because that's not the way life works. We are sold a very tempting myth in Western culture that life uh, follows a linear progression, and that if we work correctly and get through whatever storm we are in, then everything will even out and we'll be fine, and step by step, we'll be able to progress in the way that we want to. And at least in my personal experience, that is not how life works. 
That's not how suffering, that's not how different experiences come, whether we've caused them or whether we experience them. But I think that the hope that we do have is in this faith, right? Is in the promise of a God who can work a miracle and bring forth hope and greater power and greater strength from the debilitating weakness that suffering often causes in us. We have a God that can tumble over the worst of us or the worst that we have experienced and take a Good Friday evening of injustice and greater pain than we have ever known and bring about an Easter morning. That is our good news, and that is our hope. And that's what happens when, like this parishioner or us here, we are in a storm that is rocking our boat to the point of capsizing. If we can have enough courage to give that over to God, to trust even though we don't feel it or see it in the moment that the waves and the wind still know Christ's voice when he spoke calm then there will be a way for that suffering to build in us a deeper strength and a deeper awareness so that when the next storm comes, it doesn't threaten to capsize our boat so quickly or so longly. The difference is what's created in us and what is created in those around us. Do we build a strength? Do we build a faith that is deep and powerful enough to come up against the deep and powerful evil and hate that we experience or face? Or is our faith shallow um, and something that doesn't and can't speak in a powerful way to what we encounter? Where do we give the power? What do we put all of who we are into? Do, and this is hard, this is so much easier to say um, than to do, because it's terrifying what we have been and can be and will be up against, whether that be on a personal level or on a national and a global level but we can walk this together. And we can do so by every step of the way, choosing life, and when we don't, no matter how small the step, letting God work in spite of us. We have a scripture that lists the roll call of the saints, all of the people who have met deep crises and who in the miracle of their faith have been able to open themselves up and turn them over to God in such a way to bring forth that reversal that we all long for and want. No matter if that's in a reversal of the events that caused the suffering to begin with or a reversal in us to enable us to meet them so that deep can call to deep. But it's so easy to put those greats up on a pedestal and think these were the amazing people and yes, it's wonderful and I'm grateful for what they have been able to accomplish and do, but that's stuff of legend. That's the myth of our scripture. There's no way that I will be able to ever make that or be that myself. We do that in our own cultural context as well. We have the Mother Teresas and the Martin Luther King Juniors and the Mahatma Gandhis that are this other class of humanity. We do that with our athletes in the Olympics right now. But the fact is, they're human just like us. And they have made choices just like we make choices. And no, it's not that every single one of us will be the next great Olympian athlete. It's not that every single one of us will be the next Gandhi. But it is that every single one of us has a full self to be called into. When Jesus talks about, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burden, and I will give you rest, for my burden is, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, it doesn't mean that it's going to be a skip in the park and that things are going to be fine and we're going to come out unscarred. What it does mean is that that yoke is made exactly for us 
Do you know that they built the yokes or adapted them for each oxen that would carry them so that it was fit exactly to each of them so that when they went to pull the load, it would fit in just the right place that they could actually do the plowing work and do the pulling? That's what's being talked about here that it will be fit to us. And it's not that we won't, that we'll be able to handle it on our own because God doesn't give us anything too much. Because God does give us too much. That's what calls us beyond ourselves. That's what calls us to step out in faith and to rely on someone else and some others in the community. But we also know that we have a yoke that we can bear. And one of my favorite quotes from the Didache, which is this ancient church writing that we have, one of the first handbooks of Christianity from the first century church that is, that is a document that we still have today, that says in, in translation that if you can bear the yoke that God has given you, you will achieve perfection. But if you can't, then just do what you can. There are those greats among us who have borne their yokes to perfection, and it is a calling and a goal that they can set for all of us. But it is not something for us to see and cast aside as something we'll never be able to achieve. We do what we can. We are called to be faithful. We are called to take great risk and whatever we are up against to give to God. The psalm that we read today um, and the passage from Isaiah that we didn't read give the opposite roll call of faith, of what happens when suffering becomes destructive and not redemptive. It's, the psalm is a lament of the Israelites in the northern kingdom when it has been conquered by the Assyrians. And they are blaming God for abandoning them in the metaphor of a vine being planted and God removing the fence that protected it from the wild boars and from all who would ravage it. And they are blaming God for leaving them and that is why they are suffering and all that is falling apart. Yet God in Isaiah, Barry, if you would bring that slide up, has a very different perspective of what is going on and uses the same metaphor of vine. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it. He hewed out a wine vat in it. He did everything right. And he expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And then this song ends with, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. But he expected justice and saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The Israelites were blind to what was going around them, and this is a part of the accountability and the call to confession when we are a part of the suffering that is happening in our world. The Assyrians were uh, practicing um, joining fields and houses together that um, made it so that no common peasant had anywhere to dwell. Um, basically was in effect creating what we would know as the plant plantations that were run by slaves here in our country. And the prophets Micah and Amos called out against that practice and called for justice, but there was none. And so there was this falling apart that happened. And here's the catch that we miss when we don't know Hebrew. God, Yahweh, expected justice, mishpat, but saw bloodshed, mishpah. God expected righteousness, sadakah, but heard a cry, sadaka. The closeness between redemptive suffering and destructive suffering is so close. Just a few letters in Hebrew poetry. Just a few lines and the small choices we make step by step. This is something that all of us can do if we choose to. There are the roll call of saints and the greats who were able to take the yoke that was on their shoulders and run with it as best they could. 
and we might not be able to reach that best, but we can reach a best, a best in the moment of all that's going on in us to do something towards justice and righteousness, no matter how small. This is the call. Because as much as there is suffering, as much as there is bloodshed, and as much as there are cries around us, there are kingdom moments of being in the right place at the right time for the right reasons. In this real call of faith, we began it with the story of Abraham. And last week we talked about the courage it took to step out in faith and be the right person in the right place at the right time for the right reasons that left country and to follow God to a land that he didn't even know. Well, the rest of the story that we often just gloss over is that Abraham gets to that place that he didn't know and there's a famine. That does a lot of great work for building up trust, right? That there's going to be a mighty nation coming from this? Um, not so much. And so what does Abraham do? He trusts God, right? And he sticks it out and makes it work because he's Abraham. Yeah, no. <laughs> he runs fleeing, terrified, to Egypt where there is some food because he's sure God has gotten it wrong and tries to pass Sarah off as his sister, which makes a whole nother ball of mess. Um, but the point is that even the greats, stumble and get it wrong because this is hard work. But we have a God who will work in us, through us, with us, and in spite of us. And we do have a yoke and a calling to take, a race that is set before us. When the author of Hebrews calls us because we are surrounded by so, so great a cloud of witnesses, we do not run this alone. We are not in this dealing with all that comes our way alone. But we are called to run the race that is set before us, our race. Comparison can be a thief of joy. There is a race that each of us can run. There is work that only God can accomplish through us, and that is the race, that is the yoke that we are called to. And we are called to lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely to be able to run that. And that is our responsibility individually and collectively to steer us towards justice and not bloodshed, towards righteousness and not towards a cry. But we have one who has already run this race, all of ours. We have one who has already made it possible for us to take on this yoke and to accomplish this work. And so we run this race looking towards Jesus, the pioneer, the one that blazed the trail and made this possible, and the perfecter, the one that will be there when we misstep or when we can't take a step. And with Jesus as the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, we will run this race. And it will be for the joy that will be ours as God builds God's kingdom, God's justice, God's righteousness, God's loving kindness in us and through us. Brothers and sisters, we can do this. We can run this race.